So, those of you who might not have been here last week, Pastor Duran and Elizabeth are taking a couple weeks off. This is their second week. Uh, they've been away, and they decided to get away and celebrate 20 years of being here at Living Water and 30 years of, of marriage. So, we're glad they had that opportunity. And uh, so, what we've done the last, well, what we did last week, what we're going to do this week, we decided to kind of dive into Psalms 112. And what we're trying to do there, basically, is um, just look at our identity, who we are as those people who fear God and who trust in Christ. And so we started that journey a little bit last week, and it was really easy <laughs> um, for us to understand as we reviewed Revelation a little bit, just how special our identity um, is in the Lord. Um, boy, when you, know, when, you, when you understand so much, <laughs> Revelation, like we talked about, is such a book of hope and encouragement. It really is. There's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of things that deal with the end times. But overall, it's just an unbelievable book of hope and encouragement because it tells us we know God is in full control, right? He's calling the shots and he's determining all future events. And we also know uh, through Revelation, Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's victorious. He's reigning forevermore. And folks, he is coming back. That's a big part of who we are as a people who fear God. So, we, you know, just as that kind of the theme, we went into Psalms 112, and really all we got through last week, for those of you who weren't with us, is a couple of verses. We started out with Psalms 111.10, and then jumped right into 112.1. And basically, all we talked about last week was the fact that as a people who fear God, we possess true wisdom. We are the only ones on the earth that possess true wisdom. It's an unbelievable gift that we have because we fear God and Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And then we not, only, we not only have true wisdom, but then that true wisdom grows in obedience to God's word and when we take delight in God's word, as the proverb says. So there's this, this process that starts when we fear God. If you uh, do not fear God, you've not even started the journey of true wisdom yet. You're, you haven't even begun. But once you fear God, we know the scripture tells us that journey begins. And that through obedience to his word uh, and delighting in his word, we know that it grows. So, and a big part of that was just, we spent some time understanding what it means to, to really fear God. Um, we went to Isaiah 40. What a powerful, powerful uh, uh, passage of scripture that is. Um, it, nothing. Nothing compares to God. He has no equal. Period. And yes, he is a God worthy of our reverence. We talked about that. Our respect, our admiration, our submission, worship, awe, trust, undivided heart. We cannot have an, uh, an undivided heart and really, you know, fear God. All of our heart. He wants all of our heart. Okay? And we need to acknowledge him as the creator of all things. We went, we, we went through all that. And that was part of that process of talking about true wisdom. Basically, it just means putting God first when you fear God. There is an unbelievable respect and reverence that, uh, that goes there with that. So what we're going to do this week is we're going to go back into Psalms 112. And we're going to finish up the next uh, about eight verses and look at what we would call the blessings of our identity as a people who fear God. In fact, I'm, I'm just calling this, uh, this uh, message the, the blessings of our identity. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to go into Psalms 112 and do that. But before we do that, I just wanted to set it up with one thing real quick. And I think anytime you look at passages like this, this is so critical and so important. It's wise. It's virtuous. That When we look at these kind of passages, we need to not just look at them from the material or temporary point of view. We need to look at them from a spiritual and eternal and infinite point of view. A view. And I, I, you know, it, there's no doubt that spiritual and eternal blessings can manifest themselves materially. But when we look at these kind of things, we're going to find out two things as we look at these blessings. The impact they have from a spiritual and eternal point of view is just phenomenal. That's from, from the, the process of fearing God. Yes, the material and temporary was there, but more important is the spiritual and eternal. And the second thing is these blessings that come upon us, that mark us as a people who fear God, they are very interactive. It's just not like we fear God and all of a sudden, poof, 
there's some gold dust falls down on us, right? And all of a sudden, you're wealthy and rich, you got everything in your house, your kids are perfect, and pop up right on. No, 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 no. When we look at this, we're going to see just, it goes, it's so much better than that. It really is. It's, so the spiritual and the eternal aspect of it are going to be something that we're going to, really going to be dealing with this morning. Um, I tried to put it in words as I was going through this, and I'm just going to read it to you real quick. When looking at the blessings that are part of our identity as a people who fear God, we need to examine them not from the small, confined box of a worldly and temporary point of view, but instead from an infinite and eternal point of view, one that involves faith. Many times man, and this is me included, tries to define the things of God with a faithless human intellect, and as a result, we too easily put God in a very, very, very small box. Nothing is impossible for God. Absolutely nothing. And I think as we look at these blessings, hopefully we'll catch the vision of that. That from the eternal perspective, they're just unbelievable. And man, we don't want to put God in a small box. He is so much bigger than we think he is. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles up to Psalms 112. We'll go back into the scripture and we'll start looking at the rest of the blessings. Once again, last week we talked about uh, true wisdom, basically, and what it meant to fear God, what that looked like, and why he was worthy of that fear, and how that true wisdom grows, okay? We're going to start going through uh, the rest of the list. I think we have seven things here that we're going to look at that are blessings that we receive as ones, as a people who fear God, that are part of our identity. You know, I mentioned last week, you know, we don't want to be identity amnesiacs. We do not want to forget who we are as a people who fear God and who have been saved by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. It, unfortunately, it's very easy to forget that sometimes. And that's me included, but we do not want to be that way. And that's why we're working our way through this. We want to remember these things as we're going through them. We do not want to be identity amnesiacs. Okay. So we'll start out. Well, first, I'll tell you what. Let's just read all the way through Psalm 112, and then we'll come down and start uh, uh, breaking through the verses. Verse 1 here, what we did cover last week. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid. Until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Okay, let's work our way through it. We'll start with verse 2, okay? His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. What we're going to call this one is distinguished posterity. Okay, that's my English accent, in case you're wondering, right? Distinguished posterity. Uh, that's a word that actually in the King James and in the ESV and other versions you see quite a bit. And I have to admit, I was like, mm, I guess I'll kind of check that one out, right? It means just simply this. It means future generations. Distinguished future generations. This is such an important blessing because we are blessed Others are blessed, and specifically, the next generation is blessed, okay? Um, and it's very interactive, like I mentioned before. Folks, we have a huge responsibility to teach the next generation, to teach our children the ways of the Lord, the wonders of the Lord, the miracles of the Lord, the healings of the Lord, of God in general. Not only just teach them, we need to live it out in our life. They need to see it. They need to see it. 
You know, we have these kids in our home, those of you have children, and, and those of you who are here where your kids are out of the house will, will, can, will agree with me on this, I'm sure. You have them for a very, very short time. It's a short time. And, and what's even more amazing is, Cindy and I were talking about this, the first five or six years are the most impressionable, right? It's critical. Those first years, they need to hear about God. They need to have his wonders proclaimed. And they need to see it, us living it out in our lives. And, you know, if there's one thing I realized about kids, my own kids and other kids I've been around, they know when you're throwing fluff. They know when you are not making them a priority. Kids sense it. As a parent, they know. They know where you're at on that stuff. You cannot go wrong making your kids a priority when it comes to raising them in the ways of the Lord. You are bringing up the next blessed generation through that process. It's so important. Turn with me to Proverbs. This is where, yep, we're going to get this. We're going to get this. Nope. We're going to go to Psalms 22. Here we go. Just a few pages over. <laughs> I'll confess, I lost two pages of my sermon this morning. So <laughs> we happen to be on those two pages, but that's okay. Praise God. He gives us a memory for a reason, right? Psalms 22. Now we're going to look at verses 29 through 31. I'm going to read it to you first in the NIV. What we have up on the screen is going to be uh, the NLT. But I'm going to read it out of the N uh, ESV, excuse me, first. Hope I got the right. Yep, here we go. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity, there it is right there, shall serve him. Yet shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Listen to it in the NLT. Same thing. Let the rich of the earth feast and worship. Bow down before him all who are mortal and whose lives will end in dust. Our children will serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. What an amazing piece of scripture, especially there at the end. I mean, last week we had the Sanctity of Life week. We brought that up. It makes you wonder what those unborn children in the womb of their mother if it's important what they hear before they're even born. I think it is important what they hear before they're even born, what they are around, and what their parents are like and what they're saying. It's just, it's just this, this, this is a blessing that we really need to be serious about because God has blessed us with children. The next generation is so important. You know, are they going to be perfect? No. And each kid, they have their own will. They have their own upbringing. They have their own way. It's all going to manifest their self-difference. But I'm just telling you what the scripture says right here. The upright, the next generation the upright will be honored and taken care of. And we are part of that blessing. That distinguished posterity is so important as we move forward. And that's why teaching our children God's ways is so important. That's a big part of ministry, right? Right within this church what we're trying to do. We understand the importance of that next generation. Okay, let's go back to Psalms 112. And we'll go to verse 3. This is a fun one right here, right? Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Ah, good old prosperity. Boy, has the church struggled with this one over the years. Man, you get some crazy teachings on this and all kinds of different opinions and this is one where you really really in my opinion need to absolutely look at it most importantly from a spiritual and eternal point of view I think the richest the wealthiest the people with the greatest most priceless inheritance on the face of this earth are those who fear God and trust in Christ 
Folks, if you were here and you fear God and you trust in Christ, you are the wealthiest person you can possibly be. There's nothing the world can offer that is more wealth and rich oriented than that. It's just, there's nothing. It's, it, that inheritance is priceless. And if you fear God, that inheritance is yours. Absolutely. I mean, we all didn't drive here this morning in the Lamborghinis, right? But we all drove here as people in Christ who are the richest people in the world. In this fallen, temporary world. Let's talk a little bit about that inheritance. Let's look at just three different aspects. The Bible, by the way, is, once again, there's tons of scriptures on it. It's just like there was on fearing the Lord. A priceless inheritance. One, we are heirs to the covenant and promise and benefits of Abraham. That is part of our inheritance. We are part of that covenant. We are grafted into it by the blood of Christ. Galatians 3.29. One verse, but let's turn to it real quick and take a look at it. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. That's an unbelievable blessing. For those who fear God and trust in Christ. Let's look at another verse that talks about, it defines that inheritance a little bit more. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll look at uh, verses 3 through 5, I believe. Yeah, 3 through 5. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We were singing about that this morning. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To what? To inheritance that is one. It's an inheritance that is imperishable. It's an inheritance, an inheritance that is two, undefiled and unfading. And... I love this one. It's kept in heaven for you. Folks, <laughs> anything you're going to inherit in this world, let's say, of, 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 of you know, a worldly inheritance, it is temporary. It's going to evaporate. It's going to be gone. That's why Jesus tells us to store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. Look at that inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Even there, we see how important the hope of revelation is. That's an inheritance. That, I mean, is priceless. It is truly, absolutely, and completely priceless. Always, when you read passages like that, we get a lot of prosperity gospel preaching out there. And I'll tell you, an, we have an abundant life in Christ. It's just the way that abundance is defined sometimes gets real interesting. Same way with prosperity. But I'll tell you, when you read that, uh, it can't get any more abundant than that. That's an inheritance that's truly priceless. Wealth and riches in your home. Wealth and riches in your home. Okay, let's move on. To verse 4. Let's go back to 112. Let me get in the right spot here. <clears throat> this one's a great reminder. What a, what a wonderful blessing of our character and who we are. Light, verse 4. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. We're calling this one assured illumination. What a blessing. Now, this is not going to immune you from darkness, okay? And it, 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 but it does assure us the light will rise and it will drive out the darkness. This is also a very interactive blessing. We, as children of God, are children of light. 
This world is desperate for the illumination of our light. This is so interactive. I don't care if it's in your job. I don't care if it's in your family. I don't care if it's your church. I don't care if you're walking down Main Street. You are a child of light and you are illuminating that you are a child of light. It is so critical, I think, for us to understand this in our lives each and every day. I mean, once again, then this ties in with the parenting thing, right? Your kids need to see that illuminating. The younger generation needs to see that illumination. <clears throat> you know, I got up this morning just thinking about all the teachers we have in our public school system that are they're, they're followers of Christ. I am so thankful that they are there because they are illumination in that situation. They carry, and I don't care where you work, that's what you bring with you. That's what you bring with you, is that illumination. How important that is. First Thessalonians 5, let's turn to that real quick. Now let's go 4 through 8. 4 through 8. Now, what Paul's doing here, he's talking about the last days and, you know, the signs of the times that are coming. But, and he tells them, but, but listen, here's the deal in verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the light, or we are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do. Let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, other versions say light, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. We have this assured illumination. We need to be shed. It's a wonderful blessing that we've received through that. We know that that is there. Okay, let's move on to number four. And on this one, we'll actually do verse, um, verses five, six, and nine. This one we're going to title, pretty simply, Generosity. <laughs> Guess what? Very interactive. Very interactive. This is a blessing that God pours upon us. He calls us to be a generous people. Because we fear Him, He blesses us. Did you know being a generous person is a blessing? The righteous man, those who fear God, are generous. It, I mean, it's part of that illumination. This generosity is. Uh, let's go to Proverbs 11. I think we got time to do that. I was checking the clock there. This I call this... Uh, I don't even have a mark, but we're going to do it real quick. Proverbs, Proverbs 11. Yeah, I think I did give that one to you, didn't I, Sandra? <clears throat> 24 and 25. I call this uh, Generosity Economics 101. This is not a principle you're ever, ever going to see taught in this world. But here it is in Scripture. Here it is in Scripture. Verse 24 of Proverbs 11. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another one withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. There's a principle here. Giving wealth away to assist others makes one wealthier, not poorer. Now, you don't give wealth away to get richer. Which, because when you give wealth away, more is given to you, according to this principle. Why? So you can give it away. You can be generous. And the cycle continues. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 9, talks about this. It's same, the same principles right in there, starting with verse 9. This is so true. So, you know, God will give much, so we can give away much. And generosity, that's a blessing we've been given, and that is how the principle works. You know, clinging to wealth really, in a sense, causes one to lose it, not increase it. Because here's the deal if you're clinging to your wealth, it, it kind of becomes, it will become an idol. And, it, and it's usually going to be the worldly wealth 
and it's going to evaporate, it's going to fade. It, it does not have that eternal aspect to it. So, I think it's wise for us to remember when it comes to generosity, it's an eternal blessing that we pass on to others, and it's a gift that God has given us as a people who fear God. It tells us in, the, in Psalms 112 that the generous man will be remembered forever. It's important. It is, it's part of our testimony. Get back over to Psalms 12 here. There we go. The generous man, verse 9, distributes freely and his righteousness will endure forever. Figured we'd cover that verse with these two because it's the same thing. It's talking about generous, generous people. They distribute freely and that righteousness will endure forever. In fact, 2 Corinthians 9, 9, Paul quotes Psalm 112, 9. That, just what I just read you. The generous man distributes freely and his righteousness will endure forever. So if you ever get a chance, if you get, when you go home this afternoon, go ahead and go into 2 Corinthians 9. Starting with verse 9. Read through that and you'll see these same principles that are applied as a people who are generous. As a people who are generous. It really says a lot. I summed it up this way. I was looking through my journal. This is how I summed up 2 Corinthians 9. The generous giver proves his deeds are as good as his doctrine, as God's grace is displayed through his generous acts. This generous giver proves his deeds are as good as his doctrine, as God's grace is displayed through those generous acts. God's grace is displayed through those. And it's a testimony of what you believe, who you are, the blessing you received to the, to the, to the world around you, to the, that generosity really is. <clears throat> Such generosity, we must remember, will be remembered. It is an honor forever, is what it says in Psalms. It blesses people. In 2 Corinthians 9, it says it's a great thing because it causes, number one, it helps a person's need, and number two, they praise God in the process for receiving that blessing. Really a special thing in our life, this blessing of generosity. And of course, we also know in 2 Corinthians 9, be a cheerful giver, right? Okay. All right. Let's go to one that I don't know if it could be anything more appropriate for today uh, than this one. Verse 7. <clears throat> Here's another blessing, a part of our character identity. One who fears God, he is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. One of the blessings you receive, number five on my list, is you're not afraid of bad news. Those who fear God do not live in dread of what may happen. What do we do instead? We confidently trust the Lord to care for us. How, I mean, we've heard this in Revelation. We know who is in charge, has drawn his work through. We know how it turns out in the end. We do not have to live in fear or be in dread. And I, I, I mean, my problem right now with the news is I can never find any good news. Right? It's unbelievable. In my lifetime, I've never seen so much bad news that just keeps coming out again and again and again. Folks, we, we, we do not fear that. We're not afraid of it. It's going to work out. I used to take the ostrich in the sand. I said, oh, Cindy would you know, get out the news and say, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it, don't, don't tell me, don't tell me. And, the, and I said, so wait a second. We need to know what's going on in this world, and we do not need to fear it. We are in times where we're getting a lot of bad news. But the blessing we have as a people who follow Christ and who fear God is our hearts do not need to be troubled. Jesus tells us in John 16, 33, Take heart, I have overcome the world. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Again, in John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Thank goodness for that. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them, what? Be afraid. This is our Lord talking here. People, we don't need to be walking around in fear or worry. It's not healthy. It's not part of the blessing that we've received. I know some of that bad news is overwhelming. And emotionally, it can get me worked up. But the bottom line is, God is control. He is sovereign. And he's got this thing 
It's going to work out exactly the way he wants to work out. Completely and totally. Okay, that leads us into verse 8. I call this one, Confidence Under Attack. Look at verse 8. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph over his foes. So we are... We will not only triumph over our adversaries, over evil, we have already triumphed over them. Victory in Christ, as we, once again we see through the book of Revelation, is there. It is finished. It is done. Jesus wins. We win. We can be confident when we're under attack. And, and, and this one here is going to lead into the next one here pretty quick because you're going to be under attack. As a people who fear God, who believe in Jesus, who are illuminated by the light, who are walking this world to help future generations, and I could go on and on, we're not going to be liked. We're going to be under attack. In fact, I don't like using this word, but I'm, this word, but I'm going to tell you, they're going, they're going to hate us. Jesus tells us that he was hated, and because of that, they're going to hate us. We are going to be under attack. But you can absolutely have confidence when that takes place. Because why? We triumph over our adversaries. Jesus reigns. Jesus wins. We win. Confident, fearless, calm when dealing with our adversaries. Because the battles will come. They will come. I believe in the world we're living in right now. Because of all the bad news I'm reading and the different things that are going on, they're going to be, those battles are coming. They're going to be more and more and more coming. But do not fear. Do not let your hearts be troubled. God is in full control. Understand the blessing that you have as an individual who fears God and trusts in Christ. It's huge. We can stand firm, solid, confident, and fearless. And then number seven ties in with what we were just talking about, which is actually verse 10. The wicked man sees it. He sees these blessings in our righteousness. And what is he? He's angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Those who fear God, those of us who trust in Jesus... We are going to tick off the wicked. All right? We're going to, as the scripture says, infuriate the wicked. So don't be surprised when that happens. Once again, we're going to be hated. But I think this is a good thing. It's a good thing because it means you are shining, you are illuminating, you are letting the world know. I fear God, the God of all creation, the God of Isaiah 40. He's the one I worship. He's the one I revere. I believe in his son who has redeemed me and who is in control of all things and who reigns. So don't be discouraged by the hate or the disdain or the dislike that the world has toward us. This should not be a surprise as children of the light. As people who fear God and have these blessings that fall upon them. So, as the psalm starts out, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How wonderful and eternally blessed are we as a people who fear God and trust in Jesus. Our identity as a true member of God's family is precious, it's eternal, and it's powerful. Do not forget it. Don't get identity amnesia. Remember who you are. May we as a people who fear God never forget our true identity and the eternal blessings that come with it. However, in light of the gospel and the teachings of Jesus, I think we need to understand one more very important thing. And it is this. 
I mean, it's amazing our identity here, right? These things we've looked at the last couple of weeks, starting with true wisdom and working our way through. What a blessing. But folks, even more important than who we are, our identity as followers of Christ who fear God, even more important is those who do not fear God or know Jesus. Honestly, in relation to the gospel and the Great Commission and what it teaches us, I think it makes it clear. It's not just about us who trust in Jesus and fear God. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn it. He came to save it. We were already under condemnation. We were already under the curse of Adam and of his seed. He came to save us, not to condemn us. And we have a lot of people out there that are still walking around in condemnation. In the Great Commission, we are called to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Knowing, knowing that Jesus says, I have full authority in heaven and earth. I've got it. Go out there and make disciples. Baptize them, right? And he also says this, I'll be with you always. Till the end of the age, I am with you. So when we look at this, it's just not about us. Look, look at the parable of the lost sheep. If just one soul out of a hundred is lost, you pursue it until it's found and stopped from being lost. When found and restored to the flock, there is more rejoicing over the single saved lost sheep than the 99 who were not lost. We're saved. We've got the blessings. Praise God. We've got the inheritance. Oh man. Hallelujah. That one sheep, that one sheep causes rejoicing in heaven when it's found. This is a great parable of Christ. What an, what an example of what the kingdom of God is like. We take those blessings, folks. They're interactive. There are some lost sheep out there. They are stray. They need help. Look at the prodigal son. What a story. You know, he leaves his father. He goes out thinking he's going to spend all his wealth. Next thing you know, he's swallowing with the pigs and eating seeds to stay alive. He's like, boy, I think I screwed up. I'm going back home. Maybe there I can just be a common laborer. On his way back, it's, it's an unbelievable scene. I mean, he's, he's off in the distance, and the father sees him. And he is just overcome with compassion. He runs out there and starts hugging and kissing his son. And he's just going, holy cow, praise God. Kill the fatted calf. It's party time. Let's celebrate. This lost person has been found. Now the other son was a little upset about that. I said, what about me? And he said, everything I have is yours. Your inheritance is complete. But this guy was lost and now he is found. I think in light of all those blessings, we need to remember it's not just about us. It's about those out there that don't have those blessings, that don't fear God, that don't know Jesus. That folks, I'm telling you, I don't care what they tell you, most of them are absolutely miserable. They're in hopelessness. They're looking at this world we're in right now, and they're desperate. We don't fear those headlines. They absolutely ruin their day every day. They go out of their houses cringing. They're holding back. Joy in society is down. I've never seen people so apathetic. They need Jesus. We're the light. We're the illumination. I'm so thankful for what we have with that inheritance that he's given us. But he's telling us, man, guys, go out there and shine. The, 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 the world, there's lost sheep out there. So as partakers of a true and growing wisdom and an eternally blessed identity, it's, it's not just about us. It's about the lost sheep, the unsaved, those who need what we, by God's grace, already possess. We already have it. And if we're obedient in God's word and delighting in it, it is growing, right? But man, they need what we have. They need Jesus. They need a true and growing wisdom and the eternal blessings of the one who fears God. They need the hope and the encouragement of revelation.
They need to know God is in full control. They need to know they do not have to live in fear and worry. They need to know Jesus, Jesus wins. He wins. That's, I mean, when, when drawn continues the revelation, starting next week, pay attention, folks. You're going to see who wins. Now, there's going to be some crazy visions and different things and trumpets blown in between there, right? And he's going to try and work his way through all that. But I'm telling you, Christ wins. We know how this turns out. Jesus is reigning and he's going to continue to reign for eternity. And we're going to be with him. But there's a bunch of people out there that are lost sheep that don't have what we have. So my prayer for 2024, for this church, for this community, is a year for revival. Right? I think God has us perfectly positioned. What has been going on over here the last few years? He has prepped us and has us ready. We need to now go out and engage and evangelize. We need to illuminate. We need to shine. People need to see not only our love for each other, which is part of our testimony, but our love toward them. Even though, just by natural causes, we infuriate them because of our righteousness, they need to see our love. And remember, above all else, that work of bringing the gospel to others, it's a work of grace and mercy. It's, it's, not, it's not them. It's lost. It's not us. It's God's work, not ours. Grace and mercy. So, if you are here this morning, and I want you to know right now, that if you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus, if you have not surrendered to Christ, if you've not trusted in the Jesus of Revelation, in that babe that was born in a manger, in the Jesus that was crucified and defeated death and sin and is now risen and eternally forever reigning, if you don't know him, I invite you to, to accept Christ, to surrender, to turn to Jesus, to fear God. And as you receive that salvation, you start that journey of wisdom. And you get into God's word and you start feasting on it. You start growing and you start getting wiser. And you start illuminating. And you start making a difference in this world we live in. One person at a time. Which all of heaven rejoices in. Great, great rejoicing over that process. So, I invite you. If you don't know Christ, to come down here this morning, I would love to get on a knee and pray with you and, 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 and ex explain to you what it means to surrender to the God of all creation, His Son who died for you. The people who are here today that are sitting around you that know Christ, they love you very, very much. It's a family you want to be a part of, trust me. This is a family you want to join. This is a great family. As Deron would say, we are a bunch of unbelievable goofballs. Every one of us, right? But man, we are saved. We are blessed. And we love you very much. We want to be a part of your life. And I'm telling you, Jesus is the answer. He is the hope. He is what you're looking for. That is what you need. I'm excited for 2024. I think the fields are ripe. I th I'm just pray for revival, folks, and then be willing to be a part of it. So I know as we move into 2024, believe me, this is on Pastor Dron's heart big time as well. He is really, really being spoken to by God on this, on this, this mission of mercy of evangelism. Man, we, we are so blessed here, it's unbelievable. We are so positioned to have an impact on this community. It's unbelievable. Let's make 2024 an unbelievable year. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this here in prayer and dismiss us. And I, I would just like to say that if you want to talk to me about receiving Jesus, if you have any questions about receiving Jesus, please come forward. I'll wait here for you. I'll pray with you. If others come up, we'll have deacons and elders up here to pray with you. If anybody is listening online, and this is touching you and moving you and, you, and you feel the need that you want to surrender to Christ, 
you want to receive Christ, then on the screen there at the end of the service, there'll be contact information. Get a hold of us. Just come into the church. Look for a pastor. It's the biggest and the most important decision you will ever make in your life is to be a people who fear God and trust in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you have so richly blessed us with. We thank you indeed for the things that you pour upon us in our life and for the salvation we have in Jesus Christ, for the inheritance, that priceless inheritance that you've given each and every one of us. So Lord, we exalt you, we praise you, and we thank you, oh God, for your great plan of salvation. And we pray, Lord, that we'd be a people who takes it to the lost sheep. We'd be a people who loves on our community and they would, God, see that as a testimony of who we are and what we believe. Pray that this year would be a year where each and every one of us in the ways that you have called us would honor you, spread the word, encourage others, and serve you, and be under your care and protection in everything that we do, knowing we absolutely have nothing, nothing to fear. So we say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you for this day. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.